Hey guys, it's AJ McGinty here and you are listening to The Final Whistle. Enjoy. Hello and welcome back to Rugby Connection Presents The Final Whistle. Now, this week's guest, he's a cult hero in Galway, Pro 12 winner with Connaught, made over 100 appearances for the Sale Sharks, he scored over 300 points for the US Eagles and this summer he's going to be a Bristol player. It's AJ McGinty. AJ Thank you so much for coming on. How are you getting on? Thanks very much for the intro. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, just settled down in Houston. I've been here the last three days, so adapting to the heat and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, it's been good. I'm doing well. Good, good, good. I'm guessing there's um, internationals coming up for, for you boys as well then? Yeah, so we got World Cup qualifiers um, in July. So we play home and away to Chile. Um, and then before that, we got a warm up game um, against the French Barbarians here in Houston. So it's good to good to be back back involved, and hopefully the the summer will be successful for the Eagles. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, we we'll, we have a little test with uh, Chile as well. We've got Scotland A coming up against Chile. That's I think that's their warm up for yeah. you boys. So yeah. First question: We start all interviews with this just to get us the ball rolling. What actually got you into rugby in the first place, AJ? Um, from my, my first memories is just playing in the garden um, with, my, with my two older brothers and my dad and my dad teaching. I was probably too young at the time to understand anything about rugby. My dad uh, teaching my, my brother how to do like pass off, off the base like a, a number nine. Um, and that's, yeah, that's my first, first memory of it. Um, my grandfather actually uh, played for, for Ireland at uh, 15, uh, George Norton was his name. So rugby was probably always on both sides of my family. Both grandfathers played it. Um, so it kind of was passed down. It was just always um, a, a big occasion in the house in the early mornings of the Super Rugby would be on. We'd be up, make the breakfast or when the Ireland national team were making the tours down to Southern Hemisphere and you have the early kickoffs, we'd be getting up for those games. So uh, from watching on the TV to going down to the club on the weekends and kind of the dads just dropping the kids off and there's like 30 kids just playing on the field and uh, running around and then yeah you just, just out there having having a great time so that that's my that's what probably got me into is those early memories yeah i mean i i think i could say the same rugby was always a big thing for my family we never football every time I, my dad watches tv it was always rugby so yeah, didn't have a clue how it worked. I even questioned, does it like football? When I was <laughs> that didn't go very well. Um, as we know, the USA are now hosting the Rugby World Cup in both 31 and 33. What are your thoughts of it as a USA international? Yeah, I think it's... It's they've obviously been since since I've been in the setup. I think it's something that's been talked about for quite a, quite a long time of trying to 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 grow the game and and sort of build the audience in America, which which slowly it is doing in, in certain parts of the states. But I think uh, the World Cup now officially been here will be massive, and I think probably the duty of, of the team now is to kind of do well and perform well to inspire the, the, the next sort of generation that will carry it through to 2031. Cause that's, I think like since, since I've been here, I think I've been coming to America since I was like 19, I'd say, and I've been to sporting events and it's just, it's just different level um, sort of the entertainment factor or the like fan engagement. It's just like notes of going to a, a basketball game and the NBA or college football or the, or the NFL matches. So um, obviously I'm interested to see how it's going to unfold like sadly I won't be involved in it as a player it's probably a stretch on my legs a bit so um, yeah like, I, or even just just where the games will be played um, you've got so many incredible stadiums um, massive stadiums and then also I think there's different nationalities scattered throughout America like my time in Atlanta I came across like a, a large settlement of like South Africans that that had moved over like 10, 10 years before that. You'll find like if you're in you find Irish everywhere, you'll find English, you'll find Scottish. Like so um I'll be pretty excited to see sort of the, the crowds that get behind it as well. So um yeah, I think it's it's gonna be it's gonna be like a, a huge thing for the game here. And 
yeah, it would be very exciting. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask about stadiums because obviously you do have the big, massive 150,000 seater stadiums yeah. for the NFL. Do, would they fill it? Do you think they could fill yeah, any of them? Like, it'd, probably be, it'd probably be difficult to fill, but then I guess it depends where you go because this, the just the size of America, there is like, uh, like, the west the west coast i'd say this is probably the largest sort of rugby following and then texas is actually where we are now texas is a big one they've and they've got three mlr teams and uh, where it was in atlanta there's a bit uh it, it's growing too um so i don't know if they'd fill it but it's like it's still an unbelievable time i think <clears throat> back f- five or six years ago when we played in uh, the Chicago Bears Stadium in um, against Australia, and then we played again against. Oh yeah, it was against Australia. But I had a bunch of mates that came over for that game, and just said they like the the build up to it was phenomenal. And then Chicago's a, like unbelievable city to be in. So uh, they had a, they had a class time. And then uh, yeah, I think I think the, I think the World Cup and the the pull that the pull and the sort of marketing that we'll get crowds will definitely be be an increase, but. Filling a hundred thousand seater stadium probably a, a stretch. So I don't know if they'll use a stadium as big as that, but still for like traveling fans, there's so much to do, so much to experience of like seeing a stadium like that, or if there's other games on to go 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 and see that. Yeah. Is there anything that you would recommend for people that go across to the states? Because I've never been, so I wouldn't know where to start either. Yeah, um, it's funny. Like when I first moved over, I I lived in New York. And like I was young, but I absolutely loved it. And then having like I did a, a visa there, then I moved down to Atlanta, which is I was like Atlanta is again. There's there's always it's a big city, but not like New York's level. But then I lived in like the suburbs, and I was on a campus. And then when I once I moved back, to, like I played a game in New York, and I just had moved back a year later. I was like, how do they ever live here? Like the place is bonkers. It's just so intense. People flying everywhere. Um. So it's funny, like anything I've experienced at when I was in it, I, I I did love it. But I guess it depends where you go because I really enjoyed my time in Atlanta. Uh, good weather. Then New York is probably something you have to do. But too many days is is uh, like kind of like going to Vegas. You don't want to you don't want to spend too many days there because it is very intense. And then um, yeah, I'll give you. We we spend a lot of time in Denver, which is a a beautiful spot as well. And then Pacific Beach in San Diego is like probably I'd hold that in the highest highest regard. Like that is a quality place to go. Beachside, good weather, good food. You'd have a good time. Yeah, can't complain at that. Um, I know what people will be thinking. Obviously, you have got a very thick Irish accent. How do so? How do you play for for the states? Um. So having left. Like I moved over to New York at 21 and I, I was on a working visa after I did my undergrad back in Ireland. So I played for, I played rugby for in New York for um, the New York Athletic Club. And then following my year visa, I got a student visa down to Atlanta a university. It was called Life University, which is like a, they, a chiropractic school, but then they had an undergrad. So I spent three years there as well. So over the over the four years, I became US eligible through that uh, residency law, which they've now they've now changed that to five years. Yeah. So that's how I how I qualified. Just I lived in the country for for three years. So, um, not that it like it was something that I moved over to do. It just kind of like unfolded as I was here, and um, yeah, that that kind of got my foot in the door for the Eagles. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. And obviously, you you got a big cult following still to this day over in Galway for for that famous title with Connacht. How did, how did that whole season feel? Because obviously, at the start of that season, everyone kind of wrote you off as underdogs. It was never going to happen, and then shocked the world by beating Leinster at Murrayfield. Yeah, yeah it's, <clears throat> it's like having played um, in America for the first for the last like the previous like three and a half four years and then did the world cup and kind of that was my i was what 24 and 25 going into a professional environment and um my experience of conic when i was growing up in ireland was like you know out of the four teams they were the they were the weaker side and they kind of had that um 
that that was just like the attachment that they had from like every every probably all around the around the world or other like rugby playing countries is like they're the weaker of the four the four provinces and when I went in there I just was like I just I thought it was phenomenal like it was like because everything I I you know it'd be a build up in your head like oh what's a professional environment like and when I got there it was just I just really really enjoyed it sort of like your focus on making people like the players better and then the bigger focus of like four stronger provinces makes a stronger Ireland. Like it was just a great community feel. Everyone seems like rowing in the same direction. And for me coming in there, like uh, wanting to like get the most out of like the, the year I was given to like, Hey, this is, you got a, a, well, a one plus one contract, like make the most of it. You know what I mean? So I was just go out and give it my all. And yeah, the team, team was just winning the whole time I think when I got there they hadn't they hadn't lost the game because I arrived after the after the World Cup so they had been in season and uh, yeah it was just like phenomenal and then to see um, like after winning it and going back it was just like we had open top tour bus around around Galway City it was just like it was just nuts so when I watched the um, La Rochelle winning and how chaotic it was they, they had the open top top bus is like just brought back the memory of, of Galway and like just yeah just that that feeling something that you probably after that you kind of want it again and again and again but then you realize oh like it's it's not that it's not that easy and winning and being the top team is is very difficult yeah I mean hopefully I can you can get kind of back to where they were because this season wasn't their best but Every team has their ups and downs. Now, we all know that you're going to Bristol for next season. Was the man himself, was Pat Lamb a big factor in that? You re- reuniting it under Pat? Yeah, I think, um, like as I said, uh, like that year I went in, and I think that was um, Pat Lamb's thir- third year sort of in charge of, of, of Connacht. And the... the the learning I took from, from him and, and the coaching staff that were there was like, like it was every, everything like, you know, I thought going in that I knew a lot about the game. And then when I went in there, I was like, wow, well, I've got like so much, like there's just so much I didn't know or so many just little, little things um, like off the field stuff, pre- your preparation that, that I was able to learn. But then on the field, just felt like anything he he had said, or that the coaches said, or even some of the the, the, the players there, like um, little learnings or experiences they had. It like when I when I tried to implement them into my game, it worked, and I had like a, a like a positive impact on or contribution. I was like, well, that, that that's brilliant. So everything was kind of like there was nothing I was told, and then it didn't work out, which is like it's a lot of luck in that, but there's a lot of like belief and dedication to like c- committing to it. So. Um yeah, the, the opportunity to work with, with Pat again and um obviously uh Connor there's the attack coach and John Muldoon who was the captain of the Connick team who like he he was like uh, William Wallace to me when I was playing at Connick. Like he he the hair on the back of my neck stand up. So uh, I've got a lot of admiration for those guys and um I'm excited to, to work with them again. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Is there anyone particularly you want to work with on the field who you're looking forward to most playing with? Yeah, you know, like uh, I was kind of asked that before about um, like when you're when you're sort of matching up against against Bristol and how dangerous like Charles Pietro is and Semi Radraja and trying to shut them down. But I've even found uh, like. When you focus on those lads and you try and you're shutting them down, there's other players that are that are dangerous. So I think throughout the like the back line, both both nines are like nippy and um can put defenses under a lot of pressure and, and make a lot of breaks. So it'd be exciting to play with them. And I think even competing with, with Callum Sheedy, because over the years playing against him like like lovely, lovely guy, but always plays with a smile on his face and he's very very creative. So there's definitely a lot of stuff I can learn from him. So um, yeah, I'm 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 ex- I'm excited to work, work work with everybody pretty much. No, uh, that's fair. I'm gonna open up a little bit more. Obviously, we know that you're a ten, and who would be your dream halfback pairing? 
one past, one present. You don't have to have ever played with them, but yeah, who would who would be your scrum half? Uh, I'd say so. I'm picking a nine and a ten, or just a nine that I want to play with. Yeah, just a nine. You're you're a ten. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say past probably uh, George Gregan, and then present. Um, probably Aaron Smith. Nice. I like that. I play with Faf, so I'm sure Faf's high up on everybody's. Um, but I go with Aaron Smith because I've, I've already played with Faf. That's right. What's it actually like to play with Faf? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's brilliant, man. He's he can, oh, geez, he can he can do everything. You know what I mean? Um, that was one of the things that really like impressed me when he when he first um, came in. Just his his enjoyment about the game, his excitement to play, like any like anything can happen, won't phase him. He'll just get on with it, um, and then like yeah, I just see he's got he's got he's got speed when he's running with the ball. He's got a great kicking game. He's a phenomenal passer, like wrist speed, like everything balls in and out. And then he's he's smart, like his rugby like IQ or his vision is brilliant. Like he's he he'll see he'll see he'll see the space that the the, the opposition will give him. Like he's just got the whole package. Um and I think he's he's get he's getting better and better too. Yeah, and and he has a big massive wind up merchant as well. From what we've seen on t- television. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got a fan question. It's from Robert Trees. Who is your toughest opponent? And as is just a player from both club and country. Um, club. Uh, I think when Manu Tualagi was playing for Leicester Tigers, he was probably the toughest. It's kind of like the one fixture of the year where you or the two where you see like is he starting? Is he not? Because you know probably as a ten he's gonna. Be running, running over you lot. So it was, that's why it was uh, music to my ears when he came and joined Cell Sharks. So I'd say him for for a club and then country. Um, I don't know about uh, we have Manny Manny too like probably the physicality. I think my when, probably my fourth game um, for the Eagles we played against Australia in Soldier Field. And Matt Gado was playing 12. And like we got, yeah, listen, it was a tough game, but I just, he was just like so loud. He, he was just so calm, so loud, just like pulling the strings. And obviously they were on the front foot the whole time. So it's it was, um, made the game a lot easier for them, but he was still just like uh, such a boss. Like, like he was, it was brilliant, and it was like unbelievable learning for me to 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 sort of experience that on the pitch. So, uh, Matt Gido is probably one that like I'll always remember that game against them. Oh, that's fair enough, and both very very respectable players as well. Have you ever been starstruck on a, like before, just before kickoff? Like you look across the opposition and you see a certain player, and you're like, "Holy shit, it's whoever." Yeah, I think again, I think I actually wasn't playing the game. Um, but it was the, the the 2015 World Cup, and um, we it was uh, we played against South Africa in the group stages. And I just remember like the, the like size of them, and again like I'm not I'm not big I'm not big, but I was only coming out of university, so I was like <laughs> very probably still scrawny. It's, it was like just the, the pack, it's the size of the pack, and then. Brian Habana walked out from the tunnel and he honestly looked like an action, an action man. Like he was just like stacked. Um and then and then the other but the other thing about that was I thought was pretty cool was like when both teams lined like lined up the tunnel to walk out. Like the South Africans are were big, massive men, just like the the muscle just popping out of the shirts, and then like all of them I could see like looking at Sammy Manoa for the Eagles, because Sammy was a, was like a beast as well and I could just you know what I mean that's sort of like these the South African team looking at him and obviously a few of them might have played with them in, in, in Toulon at the time so uh, it was like a cool sort of respect thing going on between between the all the all the big men oh, you'll love that um, if 
you were to ever be interested in going and playing in the MLR, what team would you select? Um, probably it would be Atlanta, I'd say. Um, Atlanta is is. Uh, I know I know that area pretty well. Um, I haven't li- lived there for three years, and um, yeah, my wife's actually from not not that area, but she's from south of the city, so that would probably be the most the most convenient. But then San Diego, as I said, San Diego Legion, and it, like it's just a, a beautiful place. Um, so yeah, the, one of those two. There you go. So Atlanta, San Diego, if you're listening. <laughs> After Bristol, obviously. He's, just, he's not started there yet. So, <laughs> um, What are your aims? Well, say for next season, because this season is pretty much finished now. Obviously, you've got your internationals, but what's your what's your aims for the season coming up? Yeah, I think, like, there's a lot. To be honest, it's it's probably all off the field stuff at the moment because i got to move down once, once I arrive back. So that's what my, my, my focus is on. But... Um, um, I just to be honest, I just want to make myself available for as many games and seasons as possible. That's kind of where my focus is, and then that that's just like the, the prep I put in and how how I treat my body and, and look after myself so um, I can be as competitive as as competitive as possible and sort of contribute as much as possible. So um, you know, it's like it's a it's a new new team you're going to join. There's like forty. 40, 50 lads to get to know and then coaches and and uh, staff on top of that. So um there's it's like that that is a big change in itself because I like I like to know and and like have good relationships with who I'm playing with. So uh, I think that that's a important factor for me um in terms of like team success that lads have a good understanding of each other. So um, there's going to be a lot, lot coming my way, and probably the aim is to stay calm, and be flexible, and just, just roll with it as much as possible, enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just sounds like you need a lot of social events, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, now it is time to get to know AJ McGinty. So these aren't really rugby related; they're more just general about you. So, okay. do you do you have any tattoos? Zero tattoos. Don't like needles. Fair fair enough. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Would you rather get a winning penalty off the tee or score a drop goal? Um, Geez, they're both pretty good, aren't they? Uh, (laughs) Go drop goal. Fair enough, fair enough. Favourite pizza topping? Pepperoni, easy. Good choice. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Not for me. No Good. way. Finally, we're we're starting to turn the tide again. All of our previous guests said yeah, so no. Um, like if over here, if you go to like in New York, where one of the uh, Mike Petra used to play, it was just like pizzas strictly pep, uh, strictly margarita. You don't need toppings, but they make it like proper nice. But he's oh, like yeah, that, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Very serious about no toppings, just margarita. I think I remember seeing a video and it was in like the old town of Naples where like pizza was invented. And this like YouTuber went around and offered the whole village free pizza. And like, yeah, of course, but it was Domino's pizza. No one took it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's that's proper passion for you. What's your favorite post match drink? Um, uh, non-alcoholic would just be a Coca-Cola and then alcoholic would be a Krabby's ginger beer oh no no I've lost respect to you on that one <laughs> <laughs> I've, tried, I've tried it once and it had a yeah, I like it it had an acquired taste no I drank it, it. Was, I, was, I only got into it uh, probably like two or three years ago because my mate was up during like COVID and lockdown and all that and he brought them up and I was like wow that's delicious uh, but I was home um, I was home last week and went for a nice Guinness with my brother and my brother-in-law and that was that was brilliant but you know I think that's that was 
a Guinness in Ireland is, is better than anything else, isn't it? I don't know. I've never been to Ireland. I've had Guinness and I've enjoyed the Guinness, but everyone's like, you need it in Ireland. So yeah. hopefully one day we'll get there. It's not even that but, far. You need to get yourself over there. I know. It's money. I've got a wedding to pay for. So <laughs> yeah, that'll set you back. I'm too busy interviewing all the stars of the world like yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the one thing you have to do, but you absolutely hate doing it? I have to do, but I hate doing it. Yeah. I have to do. I know. Um, I have to do, but I hate doing it. What's yours? Probably doing the dishes. Like, I know they need done, but you're just sitting Yeah, up. yeah. From, or, yeah. or. Dishwashing or, came to mind. Yeah, food shopping as well. I hate yeah, going to a supermarket. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I did that during, I guess, because my wife was pregnant during COVID, so I had to do that a lot. But then I just took down a podcast and, and went in and did it and was, enjoyed it. Um, what do I have to do? I'd say probably I've gotten into, like, doing cold showers or ice baths and stuff like that. Yeah. I kind of, like, have to do them. I don't yeah. like doing them, but I always feel better after it. So Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you could have said changing nappies. I'm a dad. I know what it's like. You don't like doing yeah, it but again. That, need... uh, with dishwasher and nappies, that they did come to mind. But then, <laughs> yeah, well, they stink. Yeah, they're never nice. But you got to dodge the smelly ones. Yeah, I've I've managed to dodge the bullet for the most part as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, my biggest one is the supermarket. Though I hate going food shopping. If I could sit in the car and just wait. I will. I'll put the shopping in in the car. That's fine. But walking around, oh, do we need this? Do we need that? I know. But that's why. Well, my wife's very good at making lists. But that that's the thing. She was COVID, She was pregnant during COVID, so I would go out and do the shopping. But you would give me the list, and then I'd go in, and I'd just find myself up, up and down the aisles. But then I'd have to go back another aisle because I'm I'm just going from down to working down the list. Then I just said to her, it has to be like one to 20 in the order of the aisles. So it's just, I'm just going to go through like a maze and then get out. And then we, yeah. we worked on that. And then I, then I enjoyed it. You never, you're never had getting to aisle 10 and have to go back to aisle one to pick up something. So <laughs> that's fair. Make it we, always get, we always get caught in like the snack area. Like, do, oh, do we, do we not? But no, it's, oh, it's a nightmare, especially the times we go and it's like you try and beat the system you go first thing in the morning but it's all the school kids trying to get their lunch you know I'm like, oh, no go away I know, I know. Or, when, or, when, or when you're finished and then there's like only two checkouts and it's just a long line you're just like yes come on it's busy 100%. Open the just, just open all of them if you know the shop's busy just open them <laughs> and then when it's quieter shut them Don't. Ah, oh, it's the same with airports. Why at the shops and the airports is there only one person on the checkout? I know, I know. You've you've triggered me. You've managed to find pet peeves. So <laughs> I told you, I told you were going to say, why is there five hundred people trying to get through two security gates? That's the other thing. That yeah, that as well. And it's weird because I remember on holiday a few years ago. There was like 12 security points. And by the seventh one, they run this little bit of plastic over you. So me being me, just like, what is that? And they're like, it's to check for explosives. I'm like, on the seventh attempt, <laughs> you're checking for explosives. So should that not be number one? But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, right, okay, so I've got this far in. And now you're checking. Okay, smart move. Weird. Um, what is your favourite style of food? Italian. Damn. I'm get is pizza your favourite or are you a big pasta? Yeah, well pizza's nice. I just we went to, we went on holiday last year to Italy and it's like that was my first time having a proper holiday there and just the pasta and the pizza is like the best quality and then you're not paying like a lot of money for it. So just yeah, the pizzas and the and the and the um yeah, the pasta was unbelievable. 
Uh, sounds too good to be true. And that's another place in my bucket list. There's many places I'd like to go. It's like you get a nice margarita pizza or a big dish of pasta for like six euro. That's nothing. Quality, I know. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> What's your favourite film? Film? Um, yeah. I like uh, Men of Honour. I like... Um, Men of Honor is probably yeah. Men of Honor, I got like three. Men of Honor, Count of Monte Cristo, and then probably remember the Titans. Oh, nice, nice, and that's a nice different variety as well. So, what's your favorite song? I would say, well, um, probably the most played in the last like two years is Jerusalem, purely just because my my son dances to it. So that's always one that puts him in a good puts him in a good mood. Um so that's probably um, yeah, the one yeah, that's kid, probably the one I've listened to the most in the last yeah, kid, years. kids music ruined my Spotify last year as well. <laughs> the mo- most played artist of 2021 was the Wiggles. I know. Well ours is intermittent with like nurseries now. Nurseries come in when you can play music, it's, the nurseries come on. Oh, uh, no, he's he's not there yet. He's Carter's very much into that Coco Melon. Uh, mm-hmm. Absolutely hate it. Yeah. The Wiggles is fine. I could handle the Wiggles because I, I grew up watching the Wiggles. Yeah. But um, oh, my big nah. ones are Curious George and then Paw Patrol. Paw Patrol's big now. Oh, uh, I've not got we've not broken to Paw Patrol yet. I'm trying to avoid <laughs> it. I've seen it. But when he's with his cousin, he watches Peppa Pig, and oh, that drives me up the wall as well. Wow. It's not fun. Um, what's your worst tour roommate? Who was the worst to be a roommate on tour? And why? Um, worst tour roommate? I, to be honest, I haven't had bad. I don't. I haven't had bad ones. Uh, worst. You know, because we had a question like this for Sale Sharks, and my mum ended up giving out to me, but Byron McGuigan's my best mate um, for the last six years at Sale, and he's always won. He, I'd, I'd always be rooming with him, but he, he, I don't know what's going on in his stomach. Uh, <laughs> he just, the room is just not a, it's not a safe place to be in. He's just blowing up, up, so. Byron McGuigan, <laughs> Byron McGuigan, <laughs> Is is the best and the worst. That's fair. No need to get Byron on to see if he says the same about you. <laughs> Who is your biggest inspiration and why? Uh, say well, again, probably with my my parents. Um, you know, just I guess the the support and uh, like allowing me to fight like follow what I, my, my passion and well, always there for me and uh you know raise five like i've got two kids now but they raised they raised five so you probably appreciate it more when you have your kids of, of everything your your mom and dad did for you just to one keep you alive and do all the the, the duties that that are required um and then yeah just just good good role role models for me really and my, my siblings yeah, that's fair. I, I, can't argue, I can't argue with that. My mum and dad bent over backwards even now just to help me out with stuff. And like yeah. you said, when you've got your own kids, they might be different though. They act very differently with their grandchildren compared to how they did with you. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I remember getting hurt playing rugby when I was like 15, 16, and my dad's like, get up, get playing. My son falls, says, oh, come here, granddad's here. And I'm like, who are you? What happened I, there? I know. I know. My fella loves his loves his granddad, but my my dad won't like tell him off. Won't you know? If there's something, then he won't. He he hates getting put in the car seat. He won't. My mom will have to do that. Like he just stays in the good books, and he's like, my little, my little boy loves him, which is like great. We loves them both, but he's just like gravitates towards towards my dad, which is pretty cool. Oh no, my my little one's weird. So like, if you're not on the phone to them. He will just shout on them. All you hear is granny, granny, granddad. As soon as you phone them, he doesn't speak. 
I really. Like, I'm like, do you know how awkward that is? Saying like somebody's like, asking for you, and then when you show them, they're not interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, final qu- final question. And this might get you in trouble. It might not. I don't think it will. Con up or sell? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that question. There's no, there's no, they both, I love them both. I can't. There's... Fair, fair enough. I'm, I could pick it for you if you want. <laughs> Who would you pick? You pick Connacht. You're wearing the, you had the choice between I'm... green and red up there and you chose green. I picked green, yeah, because I've got a soft spot for Connacht. You were the, this well, is actually the, the final, because first... the final was obviously in Edinburgh. Yeah, that's how, that's why we went, because the, the finals were in Edinburgh. And because of my dad's job at the time, he actually went to Galway, just part of his job, and he came back with this. So it was kind of, I think this was my first non Scottish jersey. Yeah. But I didn't realise the fan base only really stays in Galway. So people seen me in the jersey and assume I was from Galway. I was like, yeah, no, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, but thank you for that. That's cool. That's cool. But you've absolutely smashed all the questions. Uh, it's been an absolute blast talking to you and getting to actually know a bit more about you because obviously you can't really know from just watching games and like the generic safe interviews, as we call it. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot, <laughs> a lot easier having a nice proper chat. Yeah, no, it's been good, mate. I appreciate it. Um, I was going to say, because we've got... Um, Duncan Hodge is, is is with us now for the next two weeks, helping oh, us nice. out. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't. Re- I actually didn't realise he'd he'd finished up with um with Edinburgh. But he was at Edinburgh for a long time, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. So he was obviously as a player. Then he got back from staff. Then he got. I think he was like temporary head coach. Then yeah. went back to attack or defence. Then he went to the Scotland team. And then I think he's yeah. Then he's with you, so yeah. No, so he's he's with us now. Um, we'll we miss you, Duncan. Chat, chatting to a uh, a big Edinburgh fan this morning. Nice. You can't you can't beat the Edinburgh fans? <laughs> Edinburgh's an Edinburgh's a quality quality place. You you did get a lot of buzz because two of the hosts are actually Connacht fans. Now I don't I don't tell them. Who we've got until it's confirmed. I was like, oh, we've got we've got another guest on during the week. No, oh, who? no, oh yeah, who's that? It was AJ McGinn and like, oh my god, it's AJ McGinn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not uh well, yeah, I've got good memories, good memories up in up in Edinburgh. Because before when I was younger as well, I went to the Leinster versus Leicester Tigers final. Um I think that was 09. But we actually like we did a sail and rail. So we we got up there, me and my mates, boat over, um, and then we got the train up, and then we t- we we just like rented a piece of land in some camping park and we pitched up some tents, did two nights there and then came back. But it was pretty unbelievable time. So good is memories. That, is, that the, is that the final where Shane Horgan bumped off too long and too long and I'll remember that and then yeah. flattened him. He gave him the point and the yeah. side, got him back. I don't need messing with him. But yeah. yeah. Um, our, our friend Sean who is one of the co-hosts big Connacht fan came across for this season's game and it didn't go well for Connacht and I was absolutely loving every minute of it. Oh yeah. I actually watched that game. It was like 50 points isn't it? Yeah. we did, I didn't expect it. Obviously I always want Edinburgh to win. But I was like, you know, Connor, is, they're that very weird team like you can't sleep on them because they will hurt you for it. Yeah. And then, like, it was 8 now to Connor, and I'm like, uh, it's going to be a tough day. And then the floodgates just opened and Edinburgh just went for it. So, no. Constantly yeah. remind Sean of that one. It's always fun. That was a, yeah, that was a hell of a that was That was before the Ireland Scotland game, the Six Nations, wasn't it? It was the week, week before. It was playing yeah. more really well. Oh, it was so weird though, because when the fixtures first came out, we had Mac Hansen on the show just after his debut for Connor. And and we love Mac. I, I still keep in touch with Mac actually. And 
the whole point of that fixture was oh, we get to see Mac Hansen, we get to see this and that, but it was during the Six Nations, so they're all away. Yeah, and he was carving up. He's been phenomenal. He has. Oh. Needs to let the locks out though. Don't don't, <laughs> don't hold it back with the white scrum cap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, but honestly, this has been an absolute blast. Um, just, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to come on in the first place. No problem, no problem at all. It's great to great to catch up, and uh, yeah, probably have to get you a Bears jersey now. Bears jersey or an Eagles jersey or both. But you actually can have a Bears jersey because you're that's down that's down Exeter, isn't it? Down by well, not. Down I've, I've got I've got all the prem top stuff, so it's all good. Apart from one, I don't have a Saracens top, but that's I don't no, I'm I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but what that, what's, the, what's the one on the right there in the back? This one, right? I don't have a USA top, so I've used a Sydney Roosters Captain America jersey because got in there. <laughs> and yeah, I've been clutching at straws with it, but it kind of works. <laughs> yeah. No. And then you've got your sail shots right behind me as well. Two jerseys. I'll try, I'll try to arrange that for you. Oh, brilliant. Absolute legend. We'll end that on a high then. This has been the final whistle with AJ McGinty, and we will see you next time. <laughs>